Chesapeake 1880, Steamboats and Oyster Wars, The Newsreader Book Two, written by Ken Rosignol, narrated by Paul J. McSorley. Forward. The Express. The following reports were published in the St. Mary's Beacon, Leonard Tom, Maryland, describing the wreck of the Express. St. Mary's Beacon, 1031, 1878. Loss of the Express. We remember no event as occurring within our newspaper experiences which has cast deeper and wider gloom in our community than that which has occasioned by the loss of the Steamer Express in the terrible storm on the Chesapeake on Wednesday morning of last week. The steamer left her wharf in Baltimore at the usual hour on Tuesday evening. Though storm signals are reported to have been flying from all prominent points in the city, in all the sad details, we find nothing to fault Captain Barker except in his disregard of this warning, and at present writing, we don't know that the criminal cupidity of the boat's owners is not more responsible for this than the captain. However, this may be the steamer proceeded down the bay without encountering any serious difficulty until about midnight. She was then off Patuxent River, and soon after struck a high east wind, which by four o'clock Wednesday had changed to a southeast and increased to a hurricane. At this point of time, Barker locates the position of the steamer as between Point No Point and Barren Island. Finding that the strain on the vessel would be fatal, that it would be impossible to weather the gale or make the Potomac, he headed for the eastern shore, which was the nearest at hand. The sea, the captain states, boarded the steamer by the forward gangplank and ran clear aft to the wheelhouse, badly straining the joiner's work and filling the fire and coal rooms. The immense amount of water shipped caused the vessel to tile to the starboard. Finding her getting lower and lower as she careened, the freight was thrown over and an attempt was made to get her up by letting go the anchors. Even this proved unavailing. At 5.30 o'clock, the hurricane deck was wrenched away and the saloon went to pieces. Mr. Francis J. Stone, purser of the lost steamer, supplies the following thrilling particulars of the final catastrophe. Every man in the crew stood at his post to the last, and not one instance of flinching or panic was seen. The officers and men stayed below, throwing cargo overboard to lighten the steamer, were assisted by several passengers until the furnace fires were out, and it was known to be useless to try to save the boat. The lady passengers were calm and resigned. Not one cry of terror was heard. The ladies assisted each other to put on life preservers. These preparations were silently made for that fight for life, which all saw was inevitable. An audibly uttered prayer here and there, a moan of suppressed emotion from one or another of the passengers in the saloon were all the outward evidences given the intense feeling which possessed the breasts of all on board. In the meantime, the express was falling over as each wave struck her, and she could not recover from the successive shock. The people helped each other up the now perpendicular side where the steamer rested, but a brief period, and the next wave tumbled her completely over. The upper work parted from the hull, and all who were not immediately drowned were floated off on whatever pieces of the wreck they could grasp. Mr. Ullman, Two colored female passengers and Mrs. Tarleton and Child did not so far as Mr. Stone knows get clear of the boat. He thinks they went under when the vessel turned bottom upward. 
When those who were swept off cleared the hull, about two minutes were allowed for everyone to do all the good he could. Mr. Stone had on his underclothes, only having stripped for the struggle, except that he was caught with his overcoat, the climax having come so quickly that he had not time to throw it aside. One of the officers helped him to get rid of the coat in the water, and his limbs were freed. An attempt was made to get Mrs. Bacon and Mrs. Jones into a yawl, but no boat could live in such a sea, and both ladies were drowned. While for a short time the people in the water were to the leeward of the wreck, they were sheltered from the gale and could help themselves and each other in selecting a piece of timber, planks, etc. The darkness and the emergency required prompt action. When the rafts drifted clear of the hull and were struck by the waves, helping one another was out of the question. Dr. Birch held onto the rail as long as he could and three times was saved by others when his hold was breaking but at last he was swept away and lost. Mr. Stone could at first trace out each group on every raft. Hawkins, a fireman on the express, had stood at his post on the steamer until waist deep in water. On the raft, he was equally cool and courageous. Willie Barker, the lad on another raft, was at first demoralized, and one of the men held on to him manfully, besides taking care of himself. When the boats from the Shirley came to the rescue, all hands on the raft were benumbed and well-nigh exhausted. Mr. Stone does not believe that any of the female passengers of the express was saved. Mrs. Isaac's chambermaid was seen on a mattress, and she had a life preserver on, but was swamped in the debris around her. The two colored women passengers were never seen after the saloon parted from the hull and broke in pieces. The three ladies were almost instantly drowned within a few minutes of the disaster. Mr. Stone thinks that the two Carringtons were carried into Hungary River and that they and perhaps others may be saved. There were on board the ill-starred boat at the time of the disaster besides the officers and crew which consisted of 21 persons and 11 passengers making 32 in all and of the whole number about 16 are believed to have been saved. We give below the names of such of the lost as are of special interest to our readers. Mrs. M. A. Jones, wife of Captain Randolph Jones. Mrs. M. A. Bacon, relict of the late Dr. Bacon. Mrs. Pinky Tarleton and son, aged six years. Dr. D. C. Birch, Leonard J. Howard, first officer of the steamer. Henry Ullman, well known here as a cattle buyer. It is believed there were some colored people belonging to the county also lost, but we have as yet been unable to ascertain their names. Four of the bodies of the drowned have been recovered. Two are those of ladies, probably Mrs. Bacon and Mrs. Jones, from the description given of them, and the others are bodies of men, both white. A body believed to be that of Mrs. Jones is buried on Adams Island, and the other three on Long Island. All of these had life preservers attached. St. Mary's Beacon, 11-7-1878, page 2, column 4. Bodies Recovered We learnt through private sources that the bodies of Mrs. Randolph Jones, Mrs. Dr. Bacon, and Mrs. Pinky Tarleton have been recovered by friends and relatives and given sepulture. The first in Philadelphia and the two last named in our county. The body of Mr. L.J. Howard, first officer of the Express, has also been obtained and interred in Baltimore. At latest accounts, neither the bodies of Dr. Birch, Mr. Ullman, nor the child of Mrs. Tarleton have been found. St. Mary's Beacon, 11-7-1878, page 2, column 4. Who is responsible? From the Washington Gazette. The Express and other steamers, violent storms, such as the one that swept along our coast ten days since, and old decayed steamboats never did get along well together. Sailors will tell you that in nine cases out of ten, the old steamboat gets the worst of it, and that it was due to a merciful providence that she did not go to the bottom with all on board. 
Some time ago, we referred in these columns to the fact that the placid waters of the Potomac were regarded by shipowners north of us as a good enough graveyard for their old, worn-out steamboats, craft of a kind that could find no employment for elsewhere, and what is more, these persons mean mercenary and reckless of human life, find respectable persons here, read to land themselves in keeping afloat, at the risk of human life, these old and dangerous boats. It is not our intention to censure anyone for the terrible loss of life on the express and other old and unsafe steamers, but to point out where in our opinion the evil lies and to invite the government to apply proper remedies. We say because every careful observer of such terrible disasters as the one to which we just referred must admit that there is gross trifling with human life somewhere and that it rests with the government to find out the parties responsible for it and administer such punishment as shall be a warning for the future. In England, the natural lifetime, as it is called, of a wooden hull steamship is eight, ten, and twelve years, according to the condition and character of the wood, as well as the workmanship and fastening. Here men prolong the natural life of a steamboat to an almost indefinite period. We do not know what scientific reasoning this is done, but it is done, and done until a violent storm puts an end to the old craft's life by sending her to the bottom with all on board, save perhaps one or two, to tell the terrible tale of suffering and death. Can it be that there is something radically wrong about our system of government inspection? The number of cases recently brought to our notice where government inspectors had given certificates directly opposite to the facts, as well in regard to hulls as boilers, leads us to the belief that many of the inspectors are either grossly incompetent or criminally corrupt. We have heard old Navy officers charge them with both. The circumstances attending the wreck of the express will forcibly illustrate the truth of what we have been saying. That steamer was built in New York about 38 or 39 years ago, if we remember right to run in connection with the Long Island Railroad. She was not suited for the purpose, and we believe another boat was built to take her place. She sat very low in the water, had an old-fashioned square engine with high counterbalance a type of engine obsolete more than 20 years ago. She was not fast and had been represented recently, and we are informed that it was with the greatest difficulty 20 pounds of steam would be kept on her. In truth, she has not power enough to stem an ordinary gale, or as the sailors say, look an ordinary sea in the face, and the wonder is that she had not gone to the bottom long ago. But let us go back to this boat's history. We lost sight of the express in the waters of New York for several years. On the outbreak of war, lo and behold, our old acquaintance turned up in the waters of the Chesapeake, ready to do duty in connection with the Army of the Potomac. There were quite a number of old, worthless steamboats which had been laid up along the banks of the Hudson for a number of years. These of a sudden were tinkered up, brought around into the Potomac, and made to do their duty in transporting troops, in the end proving a mine of wealth to their patriotic owners. Conspicuous among these worthless vessels were the Hero, the Catskill, the Croton, and the Hudson. Mr. Secretary Cameron, Simon, appointed one of his favorites, a Mr. Tucker, who held some position in a New York hotel, to the position of chartering vessels for transportation of troops, and as was afterwards shown, Mr. Tucker thought anything was good enough to carry soldiers. The Express was perhaps the best of this class of boats, but even then she was called old, and her seagoing qualities doubted. We are told, however, that she had very recently been rebuilt at the expense of sixteen or eighteen thousand dollars. Those acquainted with shipbuilding and ship repair knew very well what that means. It means little more than putting new topsides on an old bottom, etc., and we have always doubted whether it added strength to the hull as a whole. The government steamer, Tallapoosa, under the manipulation of that pair of patriots, Robert and John Andrew Jackson Cresswell, 
underwent the same sort of rebuilding at a cost to the government of $247,000. That the express was not seaworthy is shown by the fact the Lady of the Lake was out in the same gale and weathered it, not because of any skill in handling her, but because she was staunch and seaworthy. We hope the government will make a thorough investigation of this matter that the public may know who is responsible for this sad loss of human life. St. Mary's Beacon, 1114, 1878, page 2, column 4. Other Bodies Recovered A correspondent of the Sun, under the date of the 19th of November, instant, writes that the captain of an oyster punji from Crisfield picked up the body of a lady afloat near the eastern shore of the bay and finding upon it a scapula and other articles which are generally worn by Catholics, proceeded to Potomac and landed it at a home in St. Inigo's Neck, which he knew was the property of them, to say it proved to be the identical house in which Mrs. Tarleton was born and the body was identified as hers. The body of her child has also been found on the bay shore near Point No Point. They are the last of the missing victims of the express disaster, except Dr. Birch. St. Mary's Beacon, 1114, 1878, page 2, column 4. Express Officer asserts Captain acted properly. To the Editors, I feel it incumbent upon me as an officer of the late Steamer Express and the only one residing in this community to make a plain statement of facts in connection with her loss, hoping that time having cooled the general excitement, the public mind may now be in condition to form a calmer and just judgment. With this object in view, I respectively solicit the use of your columns for that purpose. Since my return home, I have heard with deep regret and reproach unjustly came upon the conduct of the owners, officers, and those concerned in the management of the vessel. The express sailed a little after four o'clock on her regular day, being detained a few minutes and taking on freight, which arrived late and without the slightest interference on the part of the owners or others to detain her. The weather had been fair during the evening, but was beginning to cloud a little, with the wind from the eastward, but with no signs of approaching storm, and not a storm signal was shown. Knowing as I did the vessel to be staunch and strong, I neither saw nor apprehended danger. The weather continued cloudy, and about ten o'clock it commenced to rain. At least I was awakened about that time, and heard it raining, but with very little increase of the wind. It was not until 12.30 o'clock that I was aroused by the heavy roll of the sea and got up to find the storm upon us. The storm or cyclone burst upon us with such fury and violence that man's efforts were futile to arrest the consequence and the result that followed. For five mortal hours, the express withstood the ringing and wrenching of the raging storm and justified to the fullest my opinion of her seaworthiness. None but an eyewitness could comprehend and appreciate the terrific and terrible force of this to me unprecedented hurricane. With those facts known to me and all on board the vessel, no censure or reproach can rightly be sustained or even intimated without being more a reflection and reproach upon God's mysterious and wonderful workings than any shortcomings or lack of forethought and judgment on the part of man. An investigation of all the circumstances attending the disaster was held at the Custom House in Baltimore by the proper authorities, and after all the evidence had adduced, the inspectors expressed themselves satisfied that Captain Barker and his crew had done everything in their power to avert the calamity. November 14, 1878. F. J. Stone.